Hey friends, this is Jeff Kinley along with my buddy Todd Hampson, and uh, we're so excited to bring to you another Prophecy Pros podcast. You know, there's so much happening in the news right now, and you know, all over the world, there's there's global crisis, there's global upheaval, uh, there are geopolitical shifts taking place, there's wars and rumors of wars, there's even the threat of nuclear war, and here we are with our open Bible saying, God, is there anything that you say about all this? And of course. We want to be very careful, Todd, to uh, only say what the Bible says, and and when we are speculating, we're we're saying that we are speculating, yeah, you know, right. kind of thing. Uh, but let's talk about that for just a little bit. Um, this whole idea of of Gog and Magog. I know this is a huge subject to kind of unpack in just thirty minutes or so. But uh, let's give our our listeners just a a general overview of what we mean when we say the war of Gog and Magog. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's a it's a future prophecy found in Ezekiel thirty eight and. One quick thing to back up. One reason we're doing this is because we've been getting a ton of questions lately yeah. about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and all that kind of stuff and how how that fits in is Russia and Bible prophecy. So this answers some of those questions, too. But rather than just start speculating and talking about what's going on in the news, we thought we'd point to some specific uh, verses in Scripture and kind of unpack Ezekiel 38 and 39 for people to for themselves to see how does what's happening right now fit into Bible prophecy. Uh, the long and short of that is we believe it's kind of just further stage setting that is showing kind of how a Gog character could act, could act towards another nation, which will eventually be in Israel. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 follow Ezekiel 36 and 37 about Israel's rebirth. And then it says basically uh, in, in Ezekiel 38, it talks about how after after the rebirth of Israel, Sometime in the future, in the in the end times, in the last days, the latter days, it says specifically that there will be this coalition coalition of nations that comes against Israel from their northern border, led by Gog of Magog. Or, and when you look at um, the who that is, when you when you study it and look into it, it's basically Russia. So it's basically a coalition of Russia, Iran, and Turkey, and a few other nations that come against Israel from their northern border. But somehow Syria is not involved in this battle, which is weird because the northern border is with Syria. So in other words, the, the table for that is kind of set right now. Um, but let's look at some specific things in Ezekiel 38 as we unpack this. Um, Jeff, is there anything in particular that jumps out right yeah, off I'm, the bat? I think a couple things do, Todd. I mean, one is, and by the way, we're broadcasting from the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. So the, the chatter in the background, so people know we're not out in the neighborhood somewhere, you know, kids are playing in the street or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in verse two of Ezekiel 38, uh, he says, son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, uh, Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against them. And uh, it says, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And it goes on to talk about how God will put hooks into the jaws of these people and basically bring them south against Israel. Now, you mentioned earlier about uh, Russia being to the north, and you know people have said, I've even got pushback on this and things that I've talked about where people said, oh, this Rosh thing just means just means a chief or head mm -hmm. or things like that. But it's talking about the prince of Rosh. It's right. equating Gog of the land of Magog and the prince of Rosh, um, which apparently seems to be like the same person there mm -hmm. in that passage. And the idea is that Rosh, although it can be a, a a proper noun, proper name. It could also be a geographical region. And here, obviously, the context says it is. But in the Bible, Todd, anytime you talk about directions, you talk about uh, which way you're going, north or south, it's always in relationship to, to Israel. And we read down in verse 15, I'm just jumping for reference sake yeah. here, that he says, you will come out of your place out of the remote parts of the north, mm -hmm. you and many peoples with you. And so when you go to the remote part of the north, I mean, it if you get to, to the Arctic, you're gone too far. That's There's right. only one people group there, and that's Russia. And so that's one reason why we believe that Russia is a part of this. So basically, the idea is that God will allow this coalition of nations uh, that will come against Israel in the last days. And chapter 38 kind of outlines who those nations are, and their modern counterparts are really easy to figure out. Mm -hmm. it's basically, Turkey and Iran and Russia, uh, on the most part, Charles Ryrie puts Ukraine uh, in the area of Magog, and so it's possible that Ukraine is a part of that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if it is, and Russia ends up really annexing Ukraine, this certainly is a part of the formation of that prophecy of uh, putting together. Now. Todd, what does it say about the timing of this? 
When does God say in history that this is going to happen? Uh, it says in several places it'll be in the latter days and or in that day. So it's we believe it's uh, associated with the time of the tribulation period or somewhere in the, the latter days of the church age near the time when God's going to come back and establish his kingdom and that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of compelling that definitely. And it's one of the most um, detailed prophecies in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so rich. You could really dig in and look at look at all these different things and just spend a lot of time just looking at the details. Um, and you brought up an interesting point with Ukraine possibly being a part of the, the Gog or the Magog. And it's how big does the footprint have to be? Because that was a question that someone asked me, like, does it mean does Ukraine have to be a part of Russia before it comes down? And I said, well, my answer was, well, look at Iran. It's it's ancient Persia. It was Persia until what, the 1970s yeah, yeah. when the revolution took place. But current Iran is not quite the size of the put, footprint that it was, you know, back in in the days of ancient Persia. But I think what God's doing here is giving us, obviously he didn't know the name of Russia and Iran back mm -hmm. then. He's giving us the general location of where those are. And, and like you said, the fact that it points to the, for Russia, the uttermost parts of the North. And like you said, we're always looking at Israel as, as center. So to me, those details are, are, he made it so clear who it is that I'm not saying there's no debate, but I think it's pretty clear that we know who these players are. Oh, absolutely. And as you said, it happens in the latter days. Now, if this invasion were to happen today, this would be a direct confirmation of the fact that we are in the last days. Yep. I mean, obviously there are many more indications that tell us we're living in the last days from the New Testament as well, but it says that it'll happen in the last days, but it also gives two other qualifying uh, characteristics of this war. It says that uh, Israel will, in verse eight, will be living securely in the land. Mm -hmm. It says in verse 11 that, um, that these nations will say on that day, I will go against the land of unwalled villages. I will go against those who are at rest that live securely, all of them living without walls, having no bars or gates. So obviously it's painting a picture of Israel being very, very secure in the land. Mm -hmm. uh, their guard is down, literally their guard is down. Uh, they fear nothing. There's no, uh, they don't seem to have a, a reason to have a, a great military presence even in terms of defending because they don't feel like they're threatened by anything that's going on. That is obviously not the case right now with Israel. I remember last uh, April, there were uh, over 4,200 rockets uh, from the Gaza Strip lobbed into Israel in just one month, mm. you know? And so Israel, I don't think, is living securely by anyone's uh, imagination there. So there has to be a time when Israel feels like she is at peace and things are going well for her. And to me, Todd, that kind of fits the time around the signing of the peace treaty, mm. uh, Daniel 9.27. I mean, I'm, some people placed it right before that. Some people placed it somewhere into the tribulation. Mm -hmm. But to me, it kind of makes sense to take place uh, around the first part of the uh, of the tribulation when Israel is at peace. And so, you know, again, he says in verse 16, it'll come about in the last days. So many, many things have to happen here for this to take place. But in terms of what's happening right now, this story is still being written, Todd. I mean, every yeah. day people are looking at reports in the news of what's happening in, in Ukraine. Is Russia going to be able to accomplish this? Mm -hmm. is, will Ukraine rise up and drive them back uh, into Russia? Will other nations, the sanctions, uh, possibly other military actions come into play? We're still waiting on that answer. Yeah. So we just, we're just saying as the prophecy pros that these are things that really could, should they continue the way they're going, yeah. these really could contribute towards the setting up of the stage for Ezekiel 38 mm -hmm. to take place at one, at one point. Exactly right. And another question we get related to that is, is Putin the Gog mm -hmm. of Gog and Magog? We don't know. He, he's acting very Gog-esque and he's not a young, he's not a spring chicken. So uh, who knows how much longer he'll be around, but uh, he's acting in the manner that we would expect that to, to happen. And yeah, I agree with you that somehow something further has to happen to where Israel feels even more secure. Maybe even, you know, this is speculation here. We said we'd always point out that, but maybe after the rapture, um, the Antichrist will arise and, and Israel will start start developing this peace talk with him. And maybe it's at that time that they feel secure or right after the signing of the covenant. We don't know. There's good good prophecy people yeah. disagree on when that is. But one reason we, we tend to put it more at the early stages or, or before the tribulation is because in 39, it talks about that they'll be burning the weapons uh, after that battle. Israel will yeah. for seven years. Yeah. So to us, that's a time cue. That's not a random 
uh, detail that kind of lines up with the tribulation period or or three and a half before, you know, Ron Rose, I think, takes the position that it there's a at least a three and a half year gap period that takes place. And then at the midpoint, because they're not going to be burning it anymore. But perhaps there's a way the way I think of it is maybe there's a way that they will. Some people will still be in Israel, even towards the end of the tribulation, burning weapons. And I believe it's there's actually I read an article the other day. I know I'm all over the map right now, but ideas are flooding my brain. <laughs> I read an article the other day about how there's new technology that you can take a nuclear weapon and convert it to energy wow. that America has and other countries have as well. So that technology is here. So you could see how if Russia came with nucle nuclear weapons. Um, but one one quick thing I wanted to mention, the very last verse of 38, I think is very telling as well about the purpose of this, about why God allows it. And he says, oh, God, I will bring you against my against my land so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through your through you before their eyes. So and the reason I bring that up is God's going to win the battle. Nobody's going to come to Israel's uh, rescue, not America, not anybody else. There's a few nations that protest. Mm -hmm. But God's saying, I'm going to come because it's my land and I want to show you. So in other words, God's almost going to step out of history again and say, hey, I'm making it clear. I'm protecting my people, the Jewish people of Israel. So that's another reason we think that this future is future uh, battle is either just before leading up to or in the early parts of the tribulation period when God's focus shifts back to the people of Israel. Yeah, in Ezekiel 38, 39, make it very clear that there's going to be divine deliverance for Israel. I think four different ways God comes in just supernaturally uh, rescues him, uh, rescues her rather. And here's something else, Todd, on this whole thing. You know, people have asked us, not only could Putin uh, be Gog, which, you know, it's possible, at least he's acting in the spirit of Gog. And, you know, that word, that proper name is mentioned 11 times in, in these two chapters. He's obviously the leader of the invasion. But people are asking us, could Putin be the Antichrist? I mean, is it possible that Putin could be the one that really kind of brings the world together. Well, certainly doesn't look like he's acting in the spirit of Antichrist in that way. Now, he's anti-Semitic and he has other characteristics, but many other leaders do as well. In the narrative that's being played out, Putin doesn't appear to be the one that's going to bring peace to the Jews. He appears to be the one that's going to threaten the Jews uh, to put together this coalition that just inches its way south towards Israel uh, to the point where they just say, well, the next step is just Israel, right? And so... For that reason, we don't see uh, Putin as being uh, Antichrist. And again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that we're not going to know who the Antichrist is. He's going to come re relatively out of an obscure background, rising out of the sea of, of the Gentiles. And so I don't think he's going to be a major player uh, on the world scene. But Todd, people want to, they just can't let it go. Yeah. You know, people just want to know who the Antichrist is. And you know, I even got an email yesterday from a guy claiming, oh, I, I, he knows who it is based upon this video that he sent me. And uh, friends, listen, you're not going to know who the Antichrist is. Uh, he's going to be somebody that's going to be, that Satan is keeping in the shadows right now, that he's going to rise onto the scene with a meteoric rise to celebrity status because of his ability to bring peace uh, to that region. And so for that reason, Satan's certainly not going to overplay his hand uh, to that degree where everyone knows who the Antichrist is. But this war of Gog and Magog is something that is prophesied. Uh, it is going to happen. Mm -hmm. We don't know when it's going to happen, but it, it'll be a one-day war. God will come in and rescue the Jews, and he'll bring uh, the sen that sense of peace uh, to to the Jews, at least for that you know, temporary time yeah. uh, from this victory. And, and, and God, I think, will use that victory to show Israel, to help Israel begin to turn back to him. Mm -hmm. uh, many Jews, I think, because of uh, what God's done for them. Definitely. And, and this is somewhat speculation, but that war also could be what leads to them being able to build the temple mm -hmm. on the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There's even earthquakes and hailstones and all that kind of stuff. I've even heard some people speculate and say, well, maybe the mosque is damaged or demolished mm -hmm. during that supernaturally, clearing the way for the building of the temple. And don't forget that the, most of the forces other than Russia are Islamic countries. Yeah. So the Islamic factor will be taken yeah. out, out, so to speak. So well, that's they'll, a great point. they'll be free to do that. And another key thing, and this is where I think some people try to connect it with Ukraine is, um, it says specifically that Gog will be coming after loot and booty and taking spoils, you know, coming after something that's that Israel has that's of value. Um, and we see we know that part of the reason with Russia and, and, and there's so much deception. I don't even want to act like I know all the ins and outs about Russia and Ukraine. But obviously part of Putin's thinking is 
Ukraine is the breadbasket. They have a lot of natural resources. They have a lot of uh, gas and oil and that kind of thing. I believe that is going to be partially what the hook in the jaw is. It says, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll get a hook in the jaw and pull you down, Gog of Magog. And basically uh, coming after, I believe, oil and gas and other other natural, natural, uh, natural resources that Israel has at that time. So uh, a lot of the detail, like I said, it's one of the most detailed prophecies in the Bible and the most detailed prophecy about a battle in the end times. You know, when I was studying this passage and, and also just the, the passages surrounding the, the rebuilding of the temple, uh, when I studied this, I had this thought. It's not an original thought I, I later discovered. You know, sometimes you think, oh, that, I, I made this <laughs> Original up. to me. Yeah, original to me. Yeah, totally. First time I've ever heard it. But um, just the idea that what's keeping Israel from building the temple on the Temple Mount where that mosque stands, which is where, by the way, the Orthodox Jews believe that the original temple was. It's not some made up theory. So what's keeping them? Well, the Islamic forces are keeping them from building that temple. Right now, if they tried to take down that mosque, there would be an international conflict, you know? So something has to happen to decimate the Islamic forces, their military might, that would then allow Israel to come in and do that. And this war, to me, makes perfect sense on how those forces will be weakened and really taken uh, out of the picture and out of the narrative so that Israel will have free reign. Of course, the Antichrist at that time could also step in and, and broker that as well, give them the idea, perhaps help make that happen, pave the way, uh, make sure that there are no Islamic forces left over, the kind of the leftover guys, you know. Mm-hmm. But once again, this is the last bastion of the Islamic stronghold in Jerusalem that's the third most holiest site in Islam, uh, in the Muslim faith. And so for them to do this will be a big deal and nothing short of divine deliverance and a war, I think will uh, be what enables them to do it. Absolutely. And a couple other details too. I mean, definitely we recommend you read carefully Ezekiel 38 and 39, because there's so many details we're not even covering, but others that come to mind in verse 11 of 39, uh, he says, on that day, I will give Gog a burial place in Israel in the valley of those who travel east towards the sea. And then he goes on to talk about uh, for several months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. And then it goes on to say there'll be professional people hired. If you look at uh, verse 14, men will be regularly employed to cleanse the land. Some will go throughout the land. And in addition to them, others will bury those who remain on the ground. At the end of seven months, they will begin their search. Anyway, um, what I'm saying is there's some indication. I've heard some people say, well, it sounds a lot like nuclear fallout or biological weapons or something where they're hiring professionals mm-hmm. to cleanse the land and where the burial place is, it's toward this, it's uh, downwind, so to speak, so that mm-hmm. even the, the weather patterns won't blow that back in. I mean, it doesn't say that, but that's the speculation yeah. is that they're buried down towards the sea, away from civilization in a safer place. Um, so there's a lot of indicators that we can kind of connect some dots and we're we're speculating a little bit, but we're looking at these details and saying, well, how does that line up with modern technology, modern weapons and that kind of thing? So it's really kind of mind blowing when you look at all of the details in 38 and 39 and how they line up with everything we're seeing today. Absolutely. And you know, even when we read Revelation and, and we kind of look at it sometimes through the lens of modern technology, which does make sense, uh, modern warfare, those type of things, we, we obviously can't be definitive about those kind of things in terms of, I mean, even technology for the mark of the beast. I mean, there's things that say, well, hey, that's right. this is so easy for the world to do right now to put a mark on someone. We don't know it's, it, that it'll be through technology or that it'll be something more primitive, you know, that'll happen. Uh, the same is true, I think, with some of these things. Is it could very well be uh, the use of modern warfare and nuclear fallout and those type of things. At the same time, it just simply could be something very divine, uh, very judgmental coming directly from God. So that's why we don't, you know, we can't be authoritative. That's but right. we can say, like Todd said, we can like sanctifyingly speculate, if yeah. you will, you know, <laughs> uh, and say, well, it could be this, it could be this. And I think that's the most important thing is that people know that there are different options and other options that none of us, including other Bible scholars, have ever even thought about. Mm-hmm. So as far as just having this on our radar, it's happening right now, uh, this stuff in the world. How it specifically relates to Ezekiel 38, uh, we don't know exactly, but we've just outlined today how these events that are happening now could be setting uh, this future prophetic stage for this future war that eventually will happen. And uh, if that's true, then in hindsight, we'll be able to look back and say, you know, we're living in prophetic times. That's right. I mean, God is really bringing all the players, all the pieces of the puzzle together 
for the end times narrative. And my friends, it, it's we're way past wondering if we're in the last days. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the question ought to be not trying to figure out every little news flash that happens and, and, then, and apply that to the Bible, but really, what about our lives? I mean, are, are we really preparing ourselves for the return of Jesus Christ? Everything about prophecy just tells us, Todd, hey, I need to make sure that my heart is ready. I'm walking with Jesus. I'm being a light for him in this world. It really does. And, and even putting Ezekiel 38 aside, we see that it, you know, wars and rumors of wars and instability and the global, na- how it's the whole globe is coming together watching this thing. Um, you know, Vietnam was the first televised war, so to speak. This is kind of the first real time war where we're seeing, you know, people That's shooting true. videos in real time. But that also brings a lot of confusion. You don't know what to believe or what's staged or what's, yeah. you know, what's true, what's not true. But it's it's what I'm saying is it's it's another global disruption on the heels of COVID and all that kind of stuff, where suddenly more and more things are happening to make the whole world look at things together and affected by it. So, you know, even just the finances of it, oils, oil and gas are going up. You know, that's yeah. going to cause more inflation, that kind of thing. Um, so these are scary things, and we talk about them because the Bible talks about them. But we, before we close out each show, we want to make sure the reason we're talking about them, like Jeff said, is because we want to give you hope. We know that all of these things are falling into place just like scripture said they would. And we know that God has promised to be with us even to the end of the age. And if nothing else, it should light a fire under us to number one, love God's word and realize how timely and relevant and practical it is. And number two, share our faith with others like never before. People are asking the big questions now. It's not time for us to be scared and be shaken by what we're seeing. It's time for us to rise up as the church be the salt and light and preach the gospel every chance we get. Absolutely. And I would just close by saying, you know, as we talk about these type of real time events, uh, I want to just say, you know, we have to be careful not to try to, again, try to find a prophecy in every headline uh, because that's obviously not, not legit. But at the same time, always go back to the scripture and the scripture, you're going to find the clarity. You're going to find the truth. You're going to find the confidence, what you believe. And that's where you really find the hope, Todd. And so uh, this whole thing with Gog and Magog and Russia and Ukraine, you know, in a year from now, we'll know more than we know now for sure, you know. Yep. But the bottom line is, is that always search the scriptures, always go back to what Jesus, what the Bible says, what the prophets say in the word of God. And if you do that, then you'll be grounded. You won't be tossed back and forth by every wind of doctrine. And you won't be deceived by a lot of people uh, that are out there postulating some very unbiblical things. So we want to be here to help point you to that rock bed solid foundation because that's what we do here on the Prophecy Pros. So thanks for listening today and uh, we'll talk to you next time. God bless you and remember to keep your eyes on Jesus.